New week on the Just Baseball Show. We've got uh, top 10 slash top 5 slash top 15s starting on Wednesday. We're going to start with the top 5 utility players in baseball. I know it's uh, everybody's favorite time of the offseason where you get to kind of pit apples to apples and and rank everybody accordingly. And it's like, hey, is Brendan Donovan better than Tommy Edmond? We'll chat about it. But today, we've got a lot of things that we want to hit. We're going headline hunting. Dylan Cease. Mm -hmm was floated to Seattle. Um, also, some notable signings. Jack Peterson is a Diamondback. Hector Neris, we both nailed, is a Chicago Cub, which was very awesome. Uh, Adam Adovino got gypped, but that was his fault, and we're going to talk about that a little bit deeper. Jack Aram, just baseball show, as always, presented by BetMGM on Monday, January 29th. Um, Thoughts on the weekend overall? Like it, there were a couple takeaways for me from from the football Sunday. I, I I noticed and I was texting you about it, and I know that we've had this conversation before in regards to Kayvon Thibodeau, where it's like that guy did admit that there were very few people that were doubting him. I listened to two post game interviews, one from Legarius Sneed with the Kansas City Chiefs, and said. You know, we battled adversity all year. People were doubting us all year. It was great to prove the doubters wrong. You're the Kansas City Chiefs. You just won the Super Bowl. I have a problem with that. Number two is Fred Warner pregame mentioned to Laura Oakman, who was doing sidelines on Westwood One. Fred Warner, linebacker for the for the Niners. He said, if you think about it, we're the underdog because everybody's rooting for the Detroit Lions, which in turn oh, makes okay. us the forgotten people. So you know, that that's the way that we're kind of going in viewing it. And I love that Kurt Warner said, yeah, nice try. I, I think we know who the underdog is. But that kind of sentiment, I, I was just kind of out on. That was my main takeaway from the weekend. I, I think it's a football thing more than a lot of other sports where you see that like self-proclaimed underdog. I'm trying to think of a baseball example of that where it's like, I, I just I just don't see it. I never would see the Dodgers. Like the Dodgers usually come up short. People doubt them in the postseason, right? Like I don't see anybody being like, on the Dodgers. Oh yeah. Everyone doubted us. No one thought we'd be here. Like, they're never going to say that because be everyone expected you to be there. No one expects you to finish the mission because you haven't outside of 2020, but I don't think you can play the underdog card uh, in, in that role. It's funny though. I guess football, you kind of need that, that edge. You got to give yourself that. I will say on the chief side to play the devil's advocate. And we talked about this with 80% of the public. You know, I know BetMGM put it out too. Like I think it was like eighty-five percent of the BetMGM public was was laying money on the Ravens, and obviously they were four-point dogs, and, and and there's more that goes into that. But um, you're still the defending champs. I'm trying again. I can't think of a baseball example where someone tried to portray themselves as the underdogs. Like you're, you're never going to see the Yankees try to portray themselves as the underdogs, even though they have not won the World Series since two thousand and nine, right? Like the Rays have been more dominant, pretty much over the last. 10 years, roughly, if you look at the regular season performance and even a lot of times the postseason performance. But I don't think that the Yankees are ever going to play the the underdog card uh, or or even the Red Sox. I, that, that might be the one team. I, I hope we don't see the Red Sox start to play the like mid-market underdog card. Like uh, we, we're, we're under restrictions that other teams aren't aren't under. And, you know, we are still making it, you know, work right now if they finally are able to, you know, kind of get out of last place after the last couple of years. Then I'll lose my mind. But again, I, I don't think we've had like a, a a cringy baseball faux underdog story yet. And I'm cool with that. I, I prefer it that way. And um, yeah, man, I just I think our sport kind of goes about it best where like everybody knows their place a little bit more. And I've got I've got some football thoughts there where it's like nobody, nobody. It's so like rah rah oriented. I'm just like, wait, we gotta stop this, man. It's sports. Yeah, I mean, you look at the way I, coaches, coaches, co coaches speaking to their, their team and everything. Like the way, the way it's always just so like, here's a a heartwarming or here's a really thought provoking story. This will inspire you. It's like a TED talk every single week when you watch Hard Knocks, which is which is absolutely insane. But I'm good. Uh, I'm good I, the underdog good. story I am subscribing to this coming season is is the Tigers, though. I'm subscribing to yes. that underdog story. A hundred percent. And they are kind of making their push. And, and we'll lead with Colt Keith signing an extension. They did something fascinating on Sunday morning. It was 
a six year 28 i've never seen this many decimals after after a million number yeah what? a six year 28.6425 million dollar offer <laughs> which is 28 million six hundred and forty two thousand five hundred dollars like yeah. do you think colt was very adamant about the 500 bucks dude i i'm looking at that and i've i i don't even understand and maybe it's a lucky number thing yeah i, I don't know um I've never Maybe. seen four digits after the decimal in, in a contract. But the, the gist is this. Six year, 28.6425. It maxes out at nine years, $82 million if three club options are exercised. Here's the breakdown. A $2 million signing bonus. So he's getting that. Two and a half mil this year. Three and a half mil next year. Four mil in 2026 and 2027. Five in 28 and 29. That takes him through arbitration. And then three club options after that. A $10 million club option in 2030, a $13 million club option in 2031, and a $15 million club option in 2032. A lot of numbers out there to say that the Tigers just did something really good with a guy that may be the most underrated offensive prospect in baseball. And this guy, you've been on him for the last two years. All he's done for the last two years is hit. He hit 306. He was flirting with 30 homers. He was flirting with 40 doubles. He had over 100 ribbies. He had a 932 OPS between AA and AAA. He's figuring out how to play second base along with playing third base. He is slowly but surely... And I say slowly, he's only, what, 21 years old? Maybe just turned 22? 22. So, like, he's he's slowly but surely become a consensus top 30 prospect because he's hit at every single level. And the Tigers just told him financially that they believe that offensive production will be there for the next eight years. And, and I believe it. <clears throat> I believe it, too. And, you know, it's this is a guy, we've talked about it, I think, on the Just Base show at times you know when we'll, we'll, we'll loop in prospect stuff but definitely on the call-up where even dating back to a year ago like i remember we had this conversation when we, when we were talking about um the what was it it would be the the all-star game the futures game so we were talking about the futures game flying through rosters things like that i mentioned cole keith i think is the safest bat in in the minor leagues or at least one of the safest bats in the minor leagues and, and for that exact reason this is the kind of player you give that deal to I, yes there's going to be some hurdles defensively. Like I don't ever think he's going to provide much value defensively, but as you mentioned, the fact that he can like get by at, at second base and now get by at third base, you have two spots where you can get by and you can work around that. Um, you know, I don't think it's uh, the Edward Julian level of, of, of liability defensively. And he's continued to get better with it. He's worked hard on his footwork and he's still young and I, I, putting on a lot of muscle. He's gotten really strong and a lot more physical. I think has made it a little bit more difficult, but now he's regained some of that agility. But it's all about the bat anyways, right? Like you'll figure the glove out and, and you're paying this guy to hit and, and he's going to hit through the duration of that contract. And overall on, on the season last year, 126 games, he slashed 306, 380, 552 between double A and triple A. It's a 932 OPS. 27 home runs and what I love about Keith is you can't really poke a hole in the offensive game and that's why he's a guy you mentioned we've been on him for two years like going into last season we had him really high up on our top 100 list and you know I think some people were surprised by that oh he's been hurt how much power is he going to hit for this and that because he was more of a hit over power guy first coming into professional baseball yeah. then he dealt with some injuries he comes back much stronger much more physical and starts impacting the baseball more but when you see that, you see the guy add strength to start hitting the ball harder, and it doesn't compromise any of the already strong bat-to-ball skills, how do you not absolutely sign up for that? It was always a comfortably 55-hit tool, I think, that you could project, which is well, you know, comfortably above average. But then being able to see that power just jump, you feel really confident about that. You got above-average hit, you got plus power, and a really good approach. Some of the key metrics that I like to look at right, when we're talking about prospects is that contact rate, which again, his contact rate's above average. The chase rate, his chase rate is lower than league average by a couple of ticks. And then, you know, what are those EVs looking like? 90th percentile exit velocity of 105. Big league average is just a hair under 104. And again, he's just 22. And that was from his age 21 season. So he's probably going to add a little bit more impact. 
and icing on the cake is this guy has no splits, man, against lefties, 306, against righties, 305, uh, and, and same power output. So, yeah, sign me up for this guy. I, I have a feeling that they're going to be picking up every single one of those options in Detroit. A hundred percent. I saw Cespedes family barbecue tweet out uh, their thoughts on the Keith extension. And they said, you know, if you don't know much about Colt Keith, Nolan Gorman is a very solid comp. And I agree. I think Keith can probably be a better defender than Gorman. Gorman has DH in his future in arbitration. I do think he's got one more year of pre-arb and then he gets to arb. And I feel like they may just make the move. Hey, Donovan's the second baseman. Gorman's the DH. Keith can probably stick at second base or third base. He also doesn't have the egregious whiff like Gorman does. And the the split is not there. Like you just mentioned. Yeah. yeah I, was just, I, I get where, where that comp is coming from. Like I, it's I like think power that, profile at second base. He's not an elite defender, that kind of thing, but like, yeah. The, and, and look, yeah. I, I could, I could see a world where the defense maybe tails that direction, right? Like guys like that sometimes go one way or another. And, uh, if that happens, like, yeah, you can see even more similarities. But like you said, that the, the, there's no issues against lefties. Like, this guy's going to be in your lineup every single day. And and I think there's a little bit more hit and a little bit less, like, just pure power. And I think some of that's because Keith doesn't need to sell out for that. I think if Keith sold out for Juice, he could put up some more power numbers. But Keith's looking to drive doubles both ways. Like, he, he can go the other way in the gap for a double, <clears throat> and then he can run into one pull side and hit you a mammoth bomb. So. I think Gorman is a lot more home run dependent. Keith is a much more well-rounded and, 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 and pure hitter, to be honest. But again, I do see I do see the the comparison from from the profile type. But I would take Colt Keith over Gorman every single day of the week, even though Gorman is already proven to be really solid at the big league level. I know people probably know that this goes back for a while. I've you know, never been the biggest you know Gorman guy, but I he's out performed a lot of my expectations but Keith is Gorman's not the type of guy I'm giving a pre-arb deal to right yeah Keith is so that should kind of show you that there's there, there's some differences there yeah um one more thing you mentioned the increased power output and I had the chance to talk to him on the call up and I'll, I'll link that episode in our description here but um I I clipped a numerical production a excerpt that he had like hey he prides himself on the numbers he looks at the numbers every day because he's got to judge himself against numbers and obviously the numbers are really good but there was a really great article written in the athletic i think highlighting keith's off season and he was training with an olympic track coach and mm -hmm. he kind of went through a bulk cut over the course of two off seasons coming into 2022 this guy bulked up like crazy Coming into 2023, he cut and he wanted to find the best blend of power and nimble athleticism that he could. And my, my favorite quote in that article, I think it was Cody Stavenhagen, was I threw up a lot. Like that's all the quote <laughs> was with Cold Keith. And that was his offseason between 22 and 23 because he wanted to find the best version of his body. And I'm telling you, dude, just like shaking his hand, sitting next to him for 15 minutes doing that conversation, I was like, you're way more physically advanced than any 21 year old should be. And he clearly yeah. put a ton into that. These guys, I, I think you're shocked. And if you've ever met a big leaguer, you probably know what I'm talking about. They're way more cut than you would expect them to be. Like they, they've just got like veins in their forearms that you don't see on normal human beings. They're just, they're bigger, stronger. You think that they may not look like professional athletes and then you get up close and they do. This guy at 21 yeah. years old looked like he was a five-year big leaguer physically. Yeah. And, and that helps a lot. Yeah. And, and I think it's part of the reason why you know, when you give these pre-arb deals, you're, you're giving it to the person too, right? You're, you're investing in the human being. You're not just investing in the player because you, you you're, risking you know losing that money right we, we look at some of these deals where you look at scott kingery and and again i think they were investing in the person and i think he he handled it you know with with grace but it, it was it was a tough situation it wasn't you know due to kingery not working hard and things like that but at least if you're going to to put money in you know evan white ex an example too i think by all accounts a a great you know clubhouse guy a hard worker injuries just derailed him you, you can't really control that but you want to try to control as much as you can when you take this kind of risk as a team. And uh, you're, you're going to invest in the players that you know work hard and are going to try to you know be the best versions of themselves and keep themselves on the field. What I think is interesting on this side, too, is that 
I think usually you'll see two years of options on the back end of these pre-arb deals, but yeah. you get a th third one here. That's, that's, you know, pretty significant 15 million, you know, in that age 30 season. But I, I think part of the reason why the, the Tigers were able to get Keith to agree to that was they're giving him some money up front. Like, and I know that's how these deals work, but this is going to be the first year you know, where he'd be making the league minimum, right? You're making the league minimum for three seasons, right? It doesn't, it doesn't bump up at all. Even in the, th the third season of pre arb it naturally kind of inflates. So I think it went from 720 to 750 this year, that kind of thing. Like it's marginal. Yeah, it's 30 it's, it's, grand it's or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, two and a half this year, then, you know, in addition to like some extra money kind of floated in there and then he gets three and a half in 2025, which is going to be, you know, well above whatever that, that, you know, nominal uh, addition to the league minimum would be. And then 4 million the year after that, you know, it, it also evens back out where it's 4 million again in 27, like you mentioned, then 25 or sorry, 28 and 29 is 5 million and 5 million, but he's, he's getting that life altering money up front a little bit more. And then those options scale up pretty well. Again, we've seen some, some, you know, of these pre-arb deals that don't go straight to 10 million, they'll go to eight, you know, or, or whatever, once it gets into, you know, club option zone. Uh, so to see it go from 10, 13, 15, like, again, I, I think it's something that the, the Tigers were comfortable doing because they feel really good about, you know, what they're getting here. And, and at the very least, like if he doesn't reach his, his uh, the, the pinnacle, right, the ceiling that you're hoping for, there's still probably a player that you're picking up a $10 million option on here pretty easily. And, and that just shows you, you know, how, how solid the floor is. But again, the, the ceiling could still be pretty high. I, and just to, to wrap a bow on the Tiger situation, obviously, if they're paying him two and a half million this coming season, he's going to be on the big league roster and he's going to be their big yeah. league opening day second baseman. And I want to say this, I, I want to try to restrict myself from applauding team for doing the bare minimum. We talked about that with the Brewers, right? Like, yay, Brewers, you, you didn't, you're not, it doesn't look like you're going to trade Corbin Burns. You went out and signed Reese Hoskins. I'm proud of you. They won the freaking division last year. I'm glad they're doing it. Like, I, I am happy that they are not just subtracting to subtract and are trying to win the division again and, and are running it back and adding. Uh, but sometimes you, you got to acknowledge these teams doing the bare minimum because a lot of them don't. And the Tigers here, it seems like over the last couple of years, they're starting to try to push things forward again. They did it wrong with Javi Baez, but I, I, I appreciate the effort. But even, you know, even still now, you have a team that's not saying, oh, you know, fuck, we, we just whiffed on Javi Baez. We're, we're going to wait this contract out and reassess. No, they're, they're trying to get creative and build a competitive team despite Javi Baez. And then when he's off the books, they can then work around that and use that money to go get another impactful player. But I like what they're building here. I can really see the vision here with Scott Harris. And I think this was another really good step to showing Detroit fans that they're in this, you know, they want to be competitive next year, but this team's going to be strong for several years to come. And I'm looking at that roster resource, right? I'm looking at that starting nine. There are a couple pieces away and, and a couple guys progressing the way we think they can from being a, a, a threat, you know, from being a really solid team. And I think in 2025, they go out and add a couple more pieces. This team could be really tough, but I think even going into this season, this isn't going to be a team that's going to roll over. This is going to be a ball club that can be floating around the wild card during the season. And I think a lot of the players just bought in a little bit further with the deal that Colt Keith just got and guys like Riley green and Kerry Carpenter, uh, potentially being able to make a leap this season and a bunch of pitching waiting in the wings as well, uh, both in the upper minors and coming off of the IL. Yeah. They have gone, I think really far beyond the bare minimum. Like, Signing Kenta Maeda was not a bare minimum deal. He, he, taking on money for Mark Canna was not a bare minimum deal. Flaherty at 14 mil, while we may look at Jack Flaherty on the field and say like, yeah, that's a bare minimum deal. It's a one-year deal. Like That financial buy-in is not bare minimum. If they wanted to do bare minimum, it would just be, hey, Zach Granke, you want to be a Detroit Tiger? Like th They didn't do that. And now this is clearly so far beyond the bare minimum because – just getting by with that, I guess, anvil attached to you in, in Javi Baez would be having Colt Keith make $2 million over his first three years. They're not doing that. And and I just appreciate yeah. their willingness to, to love the product. I mean, hell man, like they actively search for an upgrade in the TV booth. Like this is a, this is an organization yeah. that is going a bunch of different ways and they're all up. 
Like they they and, are looking at ways to improve in a variety of different verticals within their organization, which is cool. Yeah, and they didn't just upgrade the the booth. They got an all star in the booth and Jason Benetti. I mean, that's as good of a, a of a talent as you're going to get in there. So it's just cool to see them aiming high across the board. And you, you talk about the TV product wanting to to improve that. Looks like they're going to do that. You talk about trying to put together a more competitive team in the short term. Seems like they're doing that. It seems like it's all kind of coming together for Tigers fans, and they really deserve that. It, it's been a rough go over the last handful of years. And, and the last thing I'll say is what's really indicative of. I think the direction of this team is, you know, we knew Harris was going to want to shuffle some things around and, and, you know, I, I would say get the organization in the direction that he wants it to be. But at that point, doing that without completely tearing it down and without you know fully starting over is, is really impressive because he does leave, you know, he did take over an interesting situation by, you know, left behind by Alavilo, who's, who was not the best. Uh, I think he's made some of the worst moves we've seen in the last decade plus. And on top of that, we were out here, I'll say myself, pounding on the table saying, why aren't you trading fully? Why aren't you trading Lang? Like, come on. There's no reason to hold on to these relievers. Instead, they keep them. They add Shelby Miller. They add Andrew Chafin. And now you have a bullpen that all of a sudden looks pretty damn solid. And I get it. Now I get it. So I want to apologize for saying, hey, you should have moved those relievers because, look, they, they won't have a good bullpen for this year. They like their lineup. They're pitching. It could be all over the place, but we know what Scooble can be. We know the other pieces they have. They have a lot of different options that they can plug and play. And the division's kind of open. I admire what the Tigers are doing. We need more baseball teams that are in this 78 to 85 win projection buffer zone trying to push to the 85 because 85 can get you to the playoffs nowadays or at least get you in shouting distance. And isn't that what we're playing for anyways? Uh, It's good to see teams actually playing for that. You know, the other thing that they're clearly valuing is appreciation of the product in in multiple, multiple ways. So the lineup you mentioned getting good, the bullpen already good with the signings, the rotation intriguing. Do we know if it's good or not? I don't know. Like Tarek Skubal again, like, hey, really solid. He is prime for, for a pickup. Casey Mize, you know, I'm all over that redemption arc. <laughs> but I, I mean, I like, OK, the Bendeni point, right? We're a year removed from them hiring Scott Harris and getting away from firing Alavila. If AJ Hinch wasn't the the guy, they were going to move off that. Like Chris Illich is, is making it very clear that he wants to improve the, I guess, like just aura of the Detroit Tigers mm-hmm. in in every single area that he can, and it's clearly working. Last mm-hmm. thing on Keith, I I asked him. I was like, hey, what went into the draft process for him because he was not a first round pick in 2020 out of yeah. high school could have absolutely gone to Arizona state. And he said clearly, yeah, I, to be honest, I commit to Arizona state, but I just really had no interest in going to college. I just wanted to start playing professional baseball right away. That mindset kind of makes sense that he would take the money up front. He's like, dude, I get to get paid to play baseball. This is sick. Yeah. And, and good for him, man. Like that's just clearly the guy he's been since he was young and now he's getting compensated very well to play the game that he loves. And, and it's all he wants to do and worked his ass off to do it, overcame some injuries to do it. And it's again, congratulations to him. He's represented by Munger English sports management. Sh- should I know that that company? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Never heard of him. So w- well negotiated by Munger to get that, the first five or six decimal, five decimal, five decimal, uh, four, four, well, four after the decimal. Yeah. Five digits. Um, you could say, yeah, you could say you negotiated a five digit deal here, <laughs> a five digit minimum with that option. I don't know why they did it. 2.6425. But if I ever talk to Munger English sports management, that'd be the first question I ask. Yeah, uh, pretty easy one to pallet here. The Diamondbacks got better. Jack Peterson, one year, $12.5 million. That happened on Thursday night, I do believe. We did not talk about Jock signing with the Diamondbacks on the Friday show, so I want to do it now. This team got better, man. They just like added a power yep. bat. This is a team that got close, that tasted it, and that wanted to improve. And so far, they've re-signed Lourdes Gurriel. They've attacked the free agent market and gotten Eduardo Rodriguez. And now they're giving Jack Peterson a one-year deal. 
to play every day, I think, will he be the DH every day, or do you think he's going to play in a corner? I think he's going to DH. He um, shouldn't play in a corner. That defense is elite no. already. Yeah, and, you know, you have Gurriel, who's going to have preference there, I think, as well. His defense has kind of just fallen off. I mean, you look at the – you look at the. I don't like to talk about – uh, MLB players like bodies too much at that point. I, you talk about it with prospects who's you're looking at projection. You're seeing, you know, oh, is he going to, you know, potentially you can see frames and say, okay, that's a guy that's just going to get too big and strong to be able to move well enough to play center or play shortstop or whatever. Or you can look at a skinny, you know, frame and say, oh, that guy can put on more muscle and, and add more impact. With Jock, it just seems like, you know, as he's aged a little bit, he's, he's slowed down a little bit. And uh, I don't know if he's as nimble. Um, so I, I just I'd rather keep that guy out of the out of the outfield for the most part. He's passable if you want to put him out there in a pinch. But let's be real. They got him for a left handed power bat and, and they needed a left handed power bat, I think, in that lineup. I mean, they have some some fun left handed pieces. Of course, they have Corbin Carroll. But in terms of just a, a consistent can do damage from the left side guy, I, I think they were somewhat missing that. And I think also getting Jock out of San Francisco, people kind of forget that it's not the most hitter friendly place in the world. And, and now he's going to go some, somewhere where the ball is going to fly. And he's a guy that likes to, to, to drive the ball in the air and do some damage. So I, I'm, I'm excited to see how it kind of translates for him. I, I think he's going to be better. And I, I think some of the, the balls that he hit, cause he's been better. You know, last year was one of the better years in terms of driving the ball in the air with some consistency. The EVs haven't dropped really much at all. So I, I think, we could see a little bit more of a power resurgence here now playing in Arizona and not in San Francisco. And last year was one of his, his better years in terms of plate discipline, drawing walks. Like I know it wasn't the most offensively uh, impactful seasons for him, but I don't think it's a sign of, of declining skills or anything like that. I think he can get right back to 2022 jock, which was an 874 OPS. And if he's 2022 jock, this seems scary. And as you mentioned, they got better. It was it was just weird because it felt like he was lacking a rhythm at any point this year. And in 2022, is kind of a different beast. The Giants were coming off of an 107-win season. There was still some allure attached to some of those guys that were returning. Obviously, Posey didn't. But, I, I mean, you still had like a Brandon Crawford in 2022 that was playing consistently. And Lamont Wade was coming off of a really strong year. Wade was good again this year, but like Jock was the one guy that you keyed in on in 2023, especially on the heels of 2022. And being the guy in a lineup is way harder than hitting behind Corbin Carroll, than hitting in front of Christian Walker, maybe, or behind Christian Walker. Help being in the same lineup as Lourdes Gurriel and Gabby Moreno. If the yep. Giants had a Moreno equivalent talent, there's less of an emphasis placed on Jock Peterson in 2023. So my thing is this guy just took a deal to be the fourth most feared bat in a lineup as opposed to the most yeah. feared bat in a lineup. And I think that has to mean something. A absolutely. And, and I think also a key part of it is he's probably not going to face lefties at all. And, no. and, and and that's the way that this this lineup is structured. I think it's perfect. Right? And I, I know, I know he John wanted to get away from that. Like he wanted to get away exactly. from the platoon stigma. But at the end of the day, he got an everyday shot and he's signing a one year deal on the heels of that. Well, and when you'll hear me, you'll hear me say it a lot again on the call up, but sometimes on here about a, a guy taking on a bulk platoon role and bulk platoon role, you know, to me is is adjacent to a, to a regular, right? You're, you're taking the, the right handed you know, pitching side of a platoon. That means you're going to get a, a good majority of it. And that's exactly what Jock is going to get here. But that's why he got paid a little bit less. Is teams realize now he, he's he's that platoon guy. Unfortunately, he wanted to prove that he he could be you know an everyday guy uh, that that could hit lefties. And you know in 2022 he put up decent numbers there. But you look at the way that this D backs roster, this active roster is structured. You have a Gino Suarez who could end up going to the DH spot, and Emmanuel Rivera plays third when when you have Jock. You know, typically facing a lefty. Or, or you just plug in Emmanuel Rivera against left-handed pitching in the DH spot, and you're fine there too. But I think that those two guys can really hit lefties well, which helps a ton. Uh, and Rivera, to me, is more of a bench guy. He is more of that short end of the platoon guy. 
So I think it's a perfect fit, though. Rivera's going to hit lefties pretty well. Suarez can hit lefties pretty well. And you're just going to have Peterson go out there and mash righties. And, and he's going to do just that. Give them a little bit more power. They have the fun speed, defense aspect side of what they're doing. And now when you, you compound adding Suarez, adding Peterson, and bringing back Guriel, this team has a lot more power, I think, than, than they had at points last year, especially with Suarez and, and Peterson in the fold. I think that this is a really balanced lineup when you look at the speed at the top, the on-base ability, and then you now have some help with Christian Walker in terms of being able to change the game with one swing of the bat. Now you've got three guys that I really feel like outside of Corbin Carroll, uh, you know, are a home run, a consistent home run threat, which is Christian Walker, Jock Peterson, uh, and, and Eugenio Suarez. So it, it's, it's a really well-balanced and well-rounded lineup now. And, I think the D-backs are, are pretty much telling us, hey, we know that we outkicked our coverage a little bit last year and we made a nice run, but we also know that that's indicative of how talented we are, how good we can be. We know if we don't do anything, it'll be hard to get back there. But if we upgrade our team, not only can we get back there, we can push it across the finish line. And I think they're ready to do just that. I love what Mike Hazen's doing and, and co over there. So there were four 90-win teams in the National League last year. Dodgers won 100, Braves won 104. Phillies won 90, Brewers won 92. The Diamondbacks won 84 games. Mm -hmm. With what they've done in the offseason, if there are four 90-win teams in the National League, are the Arizona Diamondbacks one of those four teams? There's four. Because, I mean, we, we got to pretty much put the Dodgers in there. And the Braves. So Braves and, and Dodgers Braves. are both 90-win teams. I think the Phillies are still better than the Arizona Diamondbacks. I'm going to say, yeah, I think they're that fourth team. Who else is Those doing it for? Because I, um, I'm taking the D-backs over the Cubs. I'm taking the D-backs over the Brewers. I'm taking the D-backs over the Padres. St. Louis has improved. St. Louis has improved. I'm still taking the D-backs, I think, over, over St. Louis right now. Okay. I think With I that am addition. Too. Yeah. I, With I that think, addition, I think I am. I think Eduardo Rodriguez was the one that put me over the top. Yes. On Arizona, like they just yeah. so badly needed a three, and they got one. And fought as a four, I feel so much better about than fought as a three. Dude, fought, fought, fought. I th I like fought as a three to be honest, but I agree. Like you, you want to feel a little bit more comfortable that what we saw in the back end of the season is is sustainable is and repeatable. I I think it a hundred percent is to be clear. Uh, it, but again, also there's some confirmation bias there because you know where I was at going into the year on fought, but there's a reason why I was there going into the year on five. The, the arsenal was ridiculous. He just couldn't seem to get it all synchronized until the end of the season. I think he's got it. I think he found it. And this rotation is going to be a force. So I, they pretty much plugged every hole that they had. And then you see what Moreno did over the second half of the season, which again, you know, I'm sold on that. Uh, yeah. This team got better and better. And we're not even factoring in. What do you get from a Jordan Waller? Uh, what do you get from some of these other young guys that, that could contribute? So I'm excited for this D-backs ball club, and, and I will take them as one of those 91 teams, acknowledging that it, it could be a little bit of a dogfight with the Cardinals and, and some of these other teams, but this is great. right? We have we have probably the majority of the National League here now going into this coming season that you could say is semi-competing to competing, yes. which is which is nice. It's nice when when the list of teams that you can automatically write off is, is very short, and even the teams that you semi-write off can still surprise and float around. right? I want to semi-write off the Pirates, but they've they've made their team better this year. They're going to bring back yeah. O'Neill Cruz. Uh, you know, um, I, I like I want to semi write them off, but they're, they're not a total joke. I, th are, are, that, the that's Marlins, great. are the Marlins yeah. and Mets competing? I think the Mets. You look at that roster. That team could always hang around. That, yeah, like, that's still a good baseball team. The Marlins, no. I think the Marlins I, are the one where where you can say, hey they're not really competing. And the irony in that is, you know, they're a playoff team last year. So you could still probably with semantics say that they are a, a semi-competitive team. I'm going to say no, because they haven't signed a major league baseball player yet this, this off yeah. season. And, and they've lost Sandy and they've lost other pieces. But when you look across the national league, I think the Mets absolutely can compete because again, look at the roster, man. Like that team is, is definitely good enough to hang around for a wild card. And they've made some additions here and there. The only teams that I think you could really say in the National League that are punting or, or punting adjacent 
is the Marlins, the Rockies, and then the Pirates half. You know, they were surprising in the first half of the season and they got better. They lost O'Neal. They bring him back now. I almost think the Pirates are, it's unfair to group them in with that. And then the Nationals. So that's a very yeah. short list of teams that pretty much have almost no chance going into this year. And I think it's harsh to say the Marlins have almost no chance because they made the playoffs. So right. it's a great place. It's a great place for baseball to be. I'm glad that more teams are even giving it at least the old college try. Yeah. And, and I'll just say straight up, like take the pirates out of that, I think, because they have commit eight mil to Martin Perez and I, they are shopping for another starting pitcher. And like, we don't know what they're going to do with Skeens. Skeens may be on the roster on opening day. We have no idea how that's going to work. It, Based on the rhetoric from Bob Nutting, from Ben Sherrington, it just seems like the Pirates do want to go for a division that seems to be wide open. So I will go ahead and take the Pirates out of that. So I think it is the Rockies, the Nats, and sort of kind of the Marlins. And that's yep. three teams out of 15 that are not competing, which is, again, like and, you said, a great spot to be. And the Nats have every excuse. I'll get like the Nats are allowed to be rebuilding right now. Yeah. Um, They've had some bru- some of the worst contracts in Major League Baseball with Strasburg and, and and Pat Corbin and uh, and they, look I don't, I'm not going to defend the Soto thing but once you make that trade then you might as well fully lean into to, to resetting I, I will give them the pass on that one but I'm with you you look at this Pirates lineup it's not bad and they bring in Rowdy who gives them some upside uh, you talked about some of the other pieces that they've added they go get in a role as Chapman who they paid pretty handsomely. To, to saw it into that bullpen. And I know, you know, there's mixed opinions on that, but the guy still through stretches last year was one of the gnarliest and nastiest relievers in the, in the game. And, you know, if he's your eighth inning guy, that's fine. Uh, yeah. You've got Bednar. This is a fun, this is a fun ball club in, in, in Pittsburgh. And I feel bad that Andy went down because I'd be even more excited about it, but they, they've yeah. got some young pitchers on the way up too, that we've talked about. Uh, I think they've got what you're going to be calling games for one of the more talented Triple-A ball clubs, when you look at just young, solid players and then those kind of quadruple-A guys that can plug and play at the big league level, and when they're in triple-A, they're going to mash. Like They've got some depth, so I, I, I like this I like this Pirates team. I'm excited to talk, talk about them more when we start previewing the season. For sure. A couple more uh, quick hitters before we wrap. Hector Neris signed a one-year, $9 million deal. It is a club option for 2025 turns into a player option if he hits 60 appearances, which he did this past year. If the player option is exercised, it could escalate up to a two-year, $23 million deal. Naris is 35 years old, but one year for nine at the bare minimum is a heist for the Cubs. And you and I both had Naris going to Chicago. I said if Naris wants three for 39, three for 40, I give it to him because of how nasty he was last year. The splitter is one of the best pitches in any bullpen in baseball from last year. That splitter is disgusting. And Neris to Abreu to Presley last year was auto freaking matic. Obviously, the Astros go and get Josh Hader. So now it turns into Abreu to Presley to Hader. Neris was surplus. What the Cubs just did is they got, in my opinion, a top flight eighth inning guy. Adbert Alzali has turned into a good closer. I think Alzali is going to be a top 10 closer in baseball this year. I do believe that. The slider's gross. If yeah. you can go Neris to Alzali, damn, man. Like, the, the Cubs just got the best reliever remaining this past weekend. Well, and I love him as an insurance policy to Merriweather because Merriweather was awesome, but we, we know how how off injured he is and 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 how tough it can be for, for him just to stay on the field. 72 innings last year, that was really encouraging. And I think there's a chance that Merriweather could even be a, a solid or even at points a more solid option than there. So just have more irons in the fire thing with a bullpen. That's the way you got to do it. You got to have four guys, three to four guys that you could say, hey, if one of them goes down, I'm comfortable upgrading this guy you know, or, or promoting him to, to a higher, higher leverage situation because you have injuries. You have so much volatility that comes with this position. I will say, I think the market didn't materialize for Hector Neris because of the last several years, which were fine, but also were kind of similar to what his underlying numbers were indicative of. Right, so he had a one seven one this year in sixty eight and a third. That's fantastic. But in twenty twenty two, he had a three seven two. Twenty twenty one, he had a three six three. Those are both fine numbers for a sixth seventh inning guy. 
And then you go all the way back for his last really solid year was 2019, where he had a 293 with 28 saves with, with the Phillies. So seeming to kind of find that closer edge to him again, even though he didn't close a ton of games last year, I think it was was really huge to define that whiff. You talk about the splitter and all those things, but the expected stats still kind of had him back in that low threes range. You know, the XERA at three three five, the FIP at three eight three. Uh, so I, I think when you look at him from that lens, any team that's signing him, I think you have to operate under the assumption that you know, he's going to regress a little bit, uh, and, and maybe he doesn't, but you have to operate under that assumption. Otherwise, otherwise you're going to set yourself up for failure here. So if he's right. in the, the the high twos, low threes, this still is a good deal for them at one year, nine million. A lot of relievers that are again, look at what Chapman just got for one year. I, I have a lot more confidence in Naris being able to do something a little bit better over the duration of the entire season than what Chapman did last year. So, look, I do think he's going to regress to the high twos, low threes. But even if he does that, I still think he can shoulder the seventh, eighth thing really well. And I, at that money it's a great get and, and a cheap addition to the bullpen for just one year. So even if he does kind of hit a wall for whatever reason at 35, I think the age also factored into this. Okay. It was one year. I, th that's the really good part about it. So the Cubs have to feel great about this and hopefully still feel like they can go spend on a multi-year deal elsewhere because in Naris is just a one-year deal. Yeah. He's also like a fiery, fiery competitor. We saw him in the oh, postseason, yeah. like slapping the mound and then throat slashing on his way to the dugout, which is like hilarious and awesome. But that doesn't work on a team that's trying to play 500 ball. That works on a team that's trying to win their division. And the Cubs are so clearly trying to win their division. I think Neris probably signed with a place that he felt wanted over a bunch of other places where it's like, hey, we just want to add you to the stable. Jed's and then pitch, maybe flip you later. Exactly. Jed's pitch could have been, hey, man, you're going to pitch when it's cold outside. And we're excited to watch you do it. And, and that, I think, fires up a reliever more than anything in the world. It's like, I want the chance to throw the eighth inning in the mm -hmm. postseason. And he it, could get that opportunity. Pure speculation, but you just jogged a thought in my mind. I'm like, I, I wonder if the Pirates were in on Naris too, right? And they said, hey, you know, we'll, we're going to give you this kind of deal. But you know, Naris's agent probably saying, hey, look, this is a little bit more money. This might be a better spot, you know, for, for you to have more responsibility. But if they're not performing, you're gone, right? You're, you're absolutely going to be sent out of town. For a guy like Chapman, I think he loves it. It won him another World Series last year. He doesn't, doesn't care bouncing around, clearly. I don't think he gets very attached to any specific clubhouse or or situation. I think Chapman's more than fine bouncing him. around. But yeah. I don't think they get attached to him either. But Naris, you know, and again, I know he's a fiery guy, but I think you know, there might have been some interest in like, hey, wherever I sign, I want to be there and I want to compete for something. I don't want it to just be up in the air where I get traded to and and hope I get traded to a contender at this stage of my career. And maybe that's part of the reason why he's a Chicago Cub for a little bit cheaper than Chapman and a little bit cheaper than I think anybody thought his AAV would be. Yeah. Um, much cheaper than Adam Adovino thought he would be one year, four and a half million dollars with the Mets, the team that he declined a one year, $6.75 <laughs> million dollar player option to. So in turn, this guy wanted to figure out his worth. And in turn, his worth was $2.25 million less than it would have been if he just said, yeah, you know what? I'm a Met with the same team. And this got me thinking about Dennis Schroeder betting on himself. <laughs> was it four for $84 million offer from the Lakers in 2021? No, nah, man, yeah. I, I'm, worth, I'm worth it. And then he signs a one-year $6 million deal with the Celtics. Then he signs the veteran minimum with the Lakers. Like, that guy's gotten paid. I'm not worried about him. Adovino has gotten paid, too. I'm not worried about him. It's just such a slap in the face where it's like, I know my worth. It's less than this. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. I can't yeah. imagine being out of Vino right now, like sitting in bed being like, what did I just do, man? Yeah, I wonder, I wonder like how much is agent related in that, and then how much is just the player saying, No, like I, I think I can go do this. Like uh, I there's there's a J. Cole lyric. He says, If I if I'm betting on myself, then I completely double down. And like I love that that energy, like I love that mentality and that's probably why some of these players are so good is like if they're betting on themselves they're ready to double down they're ready to, to do whatever they got to do that's why they got to where they are 
But then, man, when you get to the top, life will life will humble you a little bit. I will say, I, I'm surprised out of Vino's market didn't materialize a little bit more, and I understand why he declined that option, and I understand why he'd want to test it out. He probably knew it was going to be a little bit of the Wild West, and it was uh, to a degree. But I don't think that uh, you know trickled down all the way to you know tier three or tier two relievers. Um, yeah. That said, this Mets bullpen is going to be solid. You get Edwin back. You got out of Vino in a setup role. They've got some other guys in there. And again, like talking about the Mets, I'm glad that they're still trying to keep it together a little bit here because if this team's healthy, they're good. If Beatty hits the way he, he can hit, you know, and, and some of these young guys perform the way they can perform and they get anything from Starling Marte, they get anything from some of the guys that didn't give him much last year, this team can can hang around. So I, I'm, I'm glad they brought him back. Um, it, it does suck when you, you make less than your, your option, but – I, I think Adovino will be just fine with four and a half mil for this year. I think so too. The the other one that kind of weirded me out with that is like, he's from New York. He was born in Manhattan. This guy's a New Yorker. Why wouldn't you just say yes to a player option? When like, it, maybe the whole time he was thinking in the back of his mind, like, oh, I'm going to opt out and get a multi-year deal from the Mets. You're already on the yeah. team that you want to be on. Just say yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I, I'm surprised he didn't get more of a market though. I know he's kind of been a polarizing reliever for some time. He's been very inconsistent, but when I, he's I good. You, he's good. I will tell you, I'm not surprised now because last year was the first year that the new base runner rules were in place. Oh, and that yeah. guy is as slow to the plate as anybody in baseball. Yeah. The cat and mouse yeah. and like the cat and mouse is more important with relievers than I think it is with starters. Starters, I just want outs and I want six innings of outs. With relievers, I do think it matters because that's when pinch runners come into the game and like, hey, you got to deal with guys on base. If Adovino allows an infield single, chances are if that guy is even remotely close to being considered an athlete, he's at second base with how slow he is to the plate. No, that's a fair point. And also like late in ball games, those 90 feet matter a lot more. A lot. A lot. A lot. So okay. So what do you I, what do you think the stolen stolen base success rate was for for I a bet it was, running on Adam Adovino? I bet it was north of 80%. Twenty so out of 23 tries, how many successful stolen bases? Uh 19, 20? 22. 22 for 23. Yep. I got to know who got caught, and I hope it was like Rowdy Telez or some shit. I can find out right now, and I have the video. It was Alec Bohm. Oh, come on, man. Oh, no, Alec Bohm was hitting. Alec Bohm was hitting. No, 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 no. Let me – I'll tell you right now. I'm watching the video. Hold on. Throw down. It was – oh, JT Real Muto. Oh. But he was called out – or sorry, called safe initially and immediately – they said, review that, review that. I think you, you see uh, McNeil immediately saying, review, 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 and they overturned it. So the one yes. guy that got thrown out was initially called safe on the field, too. It was JT Real Mutel. So Damn, man. that's a surprise. But yeah, I mean, JT's on the other side of 30 as a catcher. So that's the only guy that was thrown out by Adam, Adam Adovino last year. Ridiculous. So Yeah, so I, I do think that that guy might have been a victim of, of the new rules. Couple more things quick. Bob Nightingale reported that the Mariners are in on Dylan Cease, and it would be a package centered around Brian Wu or Bryce Miller. If I'm Jerry Depoto, th like this just feels like a call for the sake of making a phone call. Why are you doing yeah. this when you have five years remaining of control of, of Bryce Miller? If I'm not mistaken, six years of control remaining of Brian Wu, you'd go get two years of Cease. I understand that Cease was second in in Cy Young voting in 2022. I understand that this guy has not missed starts and he's one of the strikeout kings in Major League Baseball right now. But this guy's coming off a four and a half ERA. You're telling me that Wu and or Miller can't be better than Cease in 2024? I don't think it's egregious to say that like one of those guys ends up with a better year than Dylan Cease. So I think Wu, yes, very possible. I think Miller, no shot. I, I genuinely, I genuinely think Wu's a, like a full notch better than than Miller, and I can like, I'll go into that analytically, like in and pitch design wise, like when we talk about the Mariners and, and pre seat like preview stuff. But yeah, I, I just Wu, Wu, I think has a lot more going for him in terms of being able to to translate as a 
everyday starter. And remember, I remember we talked about him when he first got called up and we're like, watch out. And then he got that start against the Rangers and got pillaged and everybody was clowning yeah. me because I made a dead TikTok for that one. I was like, this is why I don't make TikToks. But then ever since then, he was great. I, like, I, I think a lot of the things that Bryce Miller does well, like Wu deceptively does them a little bit better. And then I think he has better secondaries. But I wouldn't move Wu in a situation like that. Miller, like he, he's capped. He could be, he's kind of a mid forwards guy i think that's what he's going to generally be is that that late rotation starter if that's the case like that preserves you from dumping several top prospects i could understand doing it with miller and other pieces but what i don't understand is why teams continue to call when it's been made abundantly clear that nothing that you're going to hear back from, you know, the White Sox is going to be reasonable. And no matter what, it's going to be, okay, we want Bryce Miller and we want several of your top prospects. And you're going to say no, because it's unreasonable. Like how many times do we need to have the report circulate that what the White Sox and Chris Getz are asking for is completely unreasonable. And then we rinse and repeat with another team being tied to, to, to Dylan Cease. Like, I, I feel like it's become abundantly clear that nobody is going to be able to pull this trade off until the deadline. And I don't know why these talks have not ceased to exist. Ha ha. That was good. Thanks. B. B may maybe B minus. Pedro Grifal, the manager of the White Sox, said that ceases their opening day starter at, at a White Sox event. And like, could that just be, you know, pushing rhetoric? Sure. Absolutely. But I'd probably set the odds at 70% that Dylan Cease is starting on opening day for the White Sox. I think I go higher. I, I, it just, it sounds like they're asking for just ridiculousness and maybe a big league ready starter eases that, that, ask a little bit more but, but if you're the mariners be, and you're like yeah i was to say if you're the mariners you're giving up a, a big league starter like i'm not gonna want to give up that much more i'm not gonna want to give you harry ford and other guys on top of that when i'm already giving you a starter so i i just i, I just don't see it happening i do think they're a good match though if you can if you can extend him and you're able to put a piece you know piece together a deal like miller and then they've got several prospects and i know the White Sox would be all over. I maybe just a Harry Ford and one other piece like that that could be enough. And I don't think the Mariners are losing sleep over that. But I'm very reluctant to give up a Harry Ford in addition to a starter. I do that before I give up any of my my two middle infielders and Cole Young and Cole Emerson. I think those guys are two of the top fifty prospects in baseball. Ford right in that conversation as well, but very blocked. And you know, there's there's not really a direct path for him at this point. We talked about that recently actually with Peter, and he hasn't played any other positions yet. But also, he is the contingency plan to Cal Rowley if you don't pay him. So, And if you pay Dylan Cease after making this deal, you're less likely to pay Cal Rowley. So there's yeah. just too many moving parts. I just don't see it happening. Yeah. That being said, like Bryce Miller, Harry Ford, Prelander Baroa, send it in. I, like, I'd rather have a, a prospect laden package than that, to be honest. Like, that's I the just funny don't thing know about what the White Sox want. I have no idea what they want. Yeah, I don't know what the they want either. The sun and the moon, apparently. Yeah, that's yeah, whatever that means. Um, yeah, something. If they tried asking for planets, I don't know. Um, those mm. aren't planets, though, which is tough. Like the sun's a star, and the moon, yeah, the saying. moon just kind of feels like a, a like complex lottery ticket. Super weird. Um, last thing, Matt Moore became official with the Angels corresponding move was the halos dfa tray cabbage disgusting horrible war it's absolutely dis disgusting move um it, it, it's it's just it's par for the course how could how do you do this I, i'm excited because i think trey cabbage is going to get an opportunity elsewhere and it, if you've listened to, to jack and i talk about prospects ever or really we've talked about trey cabbage a lot on here to be honest Yes. I've, I, when Trey Cabbage got called up, I was absolutely amped. He's one of my favorite guys to watch in the minor leagues because he hits the ball as hard as anybody you're going to see. He's a mammoth of a human being. His name is Huge. literally Trey Cabbage, which is cool as hell. He actually motors too. 
you unfortunately does not translate to defensive ability. He's he's very limited in the outfield and and probably a first baseman. But he went 30-30 last year. Yeah. The dude went 30-30 last season in Triple A. I understand it's a PCL. I understand it's a hitting friendly situation. I, I I get all of that. But I also watched this guy in the midst of an unbelievable year in Double A get run through by Herrera and Carnacion, compound fracture in his arm, then comes back the next year, which was this past year, and does exactly what we just saw him do, which was hit the ball absolutely as hard as anybody, steal bags, and just be fun. He walks, he makes reasonable contact. Like the joke and bit aside, I'm very surprised to see them cut bait with a Trey Cabbage over like a Jordan Adams. And I feel like a lot of that had to do with optics, right? Jordan Adams was our first round pick years yeah. ago. Uh, you know, he's, He's athletic, blah, blah, blah. Jordan Adams isn't even grayed out as a great defender in center field at this point anymore. Like his jumps and reads aren't as great. He doesn't hit the ball very hard. He doesn't make consistent contact. He's he's a sixth outfielder that's dependent on speed. And I really feel like because the Angels seem to be worried about these kind of things, I think it was an optics move. And ultimately, you, you DFA a guy that had one of the best seasons in the upper minors last year and probably – will get an opportunity very quickly with somebody else. Does he stick? Does he hit enough? I don't know, but I can promise you that he has a better chance of being a big league regular than Jordan Adams does. And it's just funny to see the Angels continue to make just kind of head-scratching moves. Do you know what they stole from us? Like, the Angels stole a 2-3-4 and four in a Salt Lake Bees lineup of Joe Adele, Trey Cabbage, and Miguel Sano. I can't believe they took that from us. Joe Adele had a 500-foot homer last year. Trey Cabbage always flirts with 500 feet. And Sano, if there's one thing he's going to do, he's going to run into 20 homers in a AAA season. He just signed a minor league deal. We could see the globetrotters of home run hitters in Salt Lake this year, and we didn't get it because they just DFA'd one of them, and he will absolutely not clear. Just sucks. And his first... In his first 14 games of 2023, he had six batted balls over 110 miles an hour. And in 2022, Trey Cabbage had a max EV of 121 miles per hour. Uh, and I know, like, I get there's more to it than EVs. He might whiff too much to be a big league regular. I don't care. I, I just, I, I think that's a guy that they could have used in the lineup, especially when you have Jared Walsh leave and you have other pieces kind of go. I know they're probably like, oh, we have Nolan Chen. Well, we're fine. <laughs> like, I get it. But, they, they could use all the power and upside. I'm excited to see whoever picks this guy up. He chases too much. I'd like to see him cut down on that. But, I mean, he can run into baseballs. I am hoping to God that they put this man in Denver. I want him a mile in the air, hitting balls as far as humanly possible. And um, I, there, there's every reason for the Colorado Rockies to put this this claim in. And I hope they do it. Uh, but if they don't, I, I get it. It's fine. They don't. They don't want to see majestic homers. They already punted on Joey Gallo. But yeah. I would love to see Cabbage out there. It would be a lot, a lot of fun. Is Trey Cabbage Mac McClung? Last thing, like Mac <laughs> McClung is a G leaguer that people yes. were clamoring for to be in the dunk contest, and he gets in and he won it. Like. All I'm asking for is Trey Cabbage being the home run derby. I think Trey Cabbage is baseball's Mac McClung. And apparently like the like the chillest dude ever. I've never met Trey Cabbage, but I've talked to a few different people who like played with him or played against him or whatever. Apparently the absolute man. So when I told you, I sat in a coffee dude. shop with him for an hour in Fort Wayne. You, me and yes. him just You, you were one of those people hour. that told me that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The homie. Great dude. 487 foot homer off of Tommy Henry uh, early last year. He can he yeah. can put him over 450. He doesn't he doesn't need a, a hitter friendly environment either. So just classic Angels parting with one of my favorite players. Their biggest loss of the off season. Uh, but I'm, I'm I'm hoping he lands on his feet and we get to see Trey Cabbage maybe at altitude uh, in Colorado or somewhere where he is appreciated. We shall see. All right. Uh, every link you need is in the episode description. We will be back with a nice conversation with Xavier Scruggs and uh, our top five utility guys in Major League Baseball for 2024 on Wednesday. We'll talk to you guys then.